Okay, so uh, the session this morning is on flexibility and complexity. And uh, that's a shorthand for saying that um, didn't quite know how to tie the things together. So half of it was flexible, half of it was complex. So flexibility and complexity. And uh, one of the things that makes life interesting and makes things a little bit complex is energy systems integration as we expand out from wind and solar integration. And we are very fortunate to have with us this morning for our keynote address, uh, Anche Orts, who is a planner from EnergyNet in Denmark. And I was just recalling Anche that uh, EnergyNet, I think was our first European TSO member of probably UWIG back in those days. So Anche has been with us for a long time. Anche is the chief engineer in the system development unit and she has uh, responsibilities both inside and outside the company and outside the company. She's very well known for her work in ENSOE, which we've heard about the last couple of days, where she heads the offshore development core group. So Anche is quite a popular person in uh, Europe these days with, I guess it's the 30 or 40 gigawatt goal by 2030 and the 300 gigawatt goal by 2050. And Anche, you would be a very popular person here in the US too, if you were here, because we have our own 30 gigawatt goal by 2030, but you're very popular here anyway. So we're very glad to have you. And uh, I wanna welcome you to the, the keynote and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie, this was really nice. And I envy you so much to be there and I hear something about receptions and the pool. And so here the day is over and I, I will go back to my cheese bread when, <laughs> when being finished here. Thank you for having me. And so, yes, um, I hope you can see the slides. Can you give a signal? Then I assume you can see the slides, otherwise yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> because I see the easy uh, thing. Uh, so, okay. Yes, uh, when Charlie asked me to talk about um, uh, systems integration and complexity and flexibility, I'm sure he did not uh, expect that the topic has now a different angle or an additional angle, I would say. Uh, so, um, yeah, in Europe, we are, uh, here's a war and this changes everything. So I'm sure you all have seen or you know about this uh, famous triangle. Uh, so um, we, when from the 90s, uh, we have the deregulation and then everything is heading for integration of energy markets, of integration of renewables and security of supply. And so we, we have learned our tri trilemma here. So foundation is uh, system security and everything should be affordable. And the target is uh, to reach the climate targets. But uh, since here's the war, so then this turns everything upside down. So now actually security of supply or energy security or independency of energy is at the top of the agenda. And this, um, reshuffles all the thoughts uh, which had been made uh, before actually. Uh, so this gives a completely new perspective and I, I will give some examples. Uh, so before the 24th of February, uh, yeah, as I just said, everything was um, driven by decarbonization. We have the famous uh, targets to, to, re to be um, fossil free by 2050 and um, also for, for several years, different um, different targets. And we use our approach that we always should um, have a holistic view across, across time, space and sectors. And the system uh, saying that the system must both function today at 2050, but also in the year 2050, uh, which, which gives, uh, I know you are experts, so don't have to explain this. So this is uh, bridging from op system operation to system long-term system planning everything is valid for from finland to portugal i think it's uh, the, uh, the biggest uh, interconnected system um, uh, uh, in in, uh, in terms of power uh, which we have and um, so now we are increasingly interconnecting or integrating systems meaning uh, that we in integrate electricity heating uh, gas and transportation but 
after uh, invasion. So um, everything is now a question of European and of national security. So uh, there are very many, there are many laws which are um, written now and uh, we have obligations we have to follow. We get many questions uh, from the political systems and uh, this also reshuffles the planning. So we have to answer questions much quicker than we are used to uh, because we always want to be thorough, but now we have to be fast, but anyway, thorough and at the secure side. So, so this is actually not that easy. And to give an example from um, system integration, we, we did integrate systems, namely the systems of Ukraine and Moldova in uh, last week at the 16th. So this was, uh, now both countries are connected to the big European uh, synchronous area before they were connected to the Russian system. Actually, this was a good opportunity because uh, Synchronization pro project was ongoing for many years, uh, very concrete since 2017, and uh, many ex investigations had been made, so it was possible. And, and then it was running on island, uh, as an island anyway, and so then it was possible to connect it to the European system, and it, it went very smooth and um, everything went nicely. So at least there we can support a bit. Um, yeah, as I said, planning is accelerating much because we have to answer all these questions from all sides. And we are also considering um, if we should change our products or not. So you might remember that NSOE uh, produces the 10-year network development plan, so the scenarios, then the 10-year network development plan, uh, and uh, plan about system adequacy, but also uh, information on the next summer and the next winter. So the sh more short-term um, products, they will be uh, re visited and maybe changed, but the long-term planning is too far in the process. So this will be, this will run uh, according to the planned process. Um, also the resource question, actually the scenarios, this is of course turned upside down because now um, commission, European Commission says we will cut European gas by two thirds by, uh, by the end of this year. And, uh, this is a lot because we have 55% dependency um, uh, of gas uh, from Russia in in Europe. So this is quite some amount. Um, yeah, how do we do this? So the commission uh, published um, communication uh, at the 8th of March, uh, the link is included, uh, giving some instructions uh, which actions we could take. So so there are, of course, first actions on the very high prices, especially on gas. Um, and they are so high because the storages are not uh, very much filled. So they had not been filled before this winter and uh, now, now they're even less filled. Uh, so um, which keeps the prices high. And so now it's discussed maybe to have some measures on the retail market or on the whole wholesale market or giving um, some incentives or some some money to consumers directly. So you, you can see um, some measures are indicated and even market um, market design is discussed. Um, also state, state aid measures might be taken. So then uh, the commission says that the storages for gas storages have to be filled by 1st of October by 90%. We did not reach 75% uh, at the end of, also only running on market terms uh, in last year because the price, the gas prices have had been high all the time. And so there was not really an incentive to, to fill expensive gas into the storages. But now, no matter how, how the price is the commission wants, it has to be filled by 90%. Um, and this, of course, um, some countries create some extra entities to take care that this happens, but this maybe then also keeps the prices extra high. So, so there's always a balance uh, when, as a should the market work or should uh, there be some governmental interaction? So and the balance is uh, hard to keep. What, what is the right balance? Um, I'm sure the gas operators will be 
visited. And in the, the longer term measures are indicated here. So um, extreme increase of renewables and much, much, much faster than uh, always had been planned, more diverse gas supplies, uh, decarbonization of the sectors, of course, um, biomethane should be increased and uh, hydrogen, that's also the key to many of these activities. So now I um, I will go first a bit into the details how we do uh, things in Denmark and then come to the European system because we are one out of five uh, TSOs in Europe which have both electricity and gas infrastructure. So uh, the vision I think is it's quite similar everywhere so that uh, all the systems will be connected. So we have indicated in blue electricity system in yellow, the gas system, then at some point filled with biomass and on maybe having an extra hydrogen infrastructure and heating system and everything can play together. Um, these are the building blocks. And then of course, um, it can be done differently. So we have currently big discussions about building hydrogen infrastructure of filling hydrogen in, hydrogen into existing fossil infrastructure. It could be mixed or it could also be repurposed, uh, which requires then some, some uh, build uh, measures uh, on the existing gas grid because fossil fuels will decrease when there is room in the pipeline. Uh, so, so this variant indicates that electrolyzers could be placed where the renewables are and then transport hydrogen to cons consumers, uh, which has the advantage um, that this could be done quickly. Um, but the infrastructure does not exist yet. The classic solution is, of course, place electrolyzers at the customers, transport everything by electricity lines, but um, that's not very popular and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot uh, electricity lines would be needed. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's slow. So a combination of both might be the way forward so that we can avoid a bit electricity built by using um, potentially hydrogen infrastructure and co-locate um, all these building blocks in, in uh, special zones. Um, so having the renewables there where, is, uh, where the inter, where the electrolyzers are and the consumption and also methane production. I don't know if, also there are already some in, in Denmark, we have already a quite famous park, which is a green lab uh, where, where everything is co-located and um, the companies on this area, they exchange all these products. But how do we do this as TSO? So at, at one hand, we have uh, these big energy islands, which, which you might have heard about. So we plan to build two energy islands. One is actually an existing island that is Bornholm. Uh, one is two gigawatt wind. Uh, the other one is three gigawatt wind and might be expanded to 10 gigawatt, but which is then by far exceeding the demand we have in Denmark. And therefore we already planned from the first uh, uh, day to connect to other countries as well. And so this might then be the starting point of some offshore infrastructure. We also have the information about prices, price indication uh, in different zones uh, in the uh, electricity grid. Uh, here in the third picture, you can see we are gas grid owner and uh, operator. And so we know about um, yeah the gas infrastructure and where is biogas potential. So we are a rural country and uh, there's a lot of biogas potential and there could be um, uh, carbon for synthetic liquids could be produced at these places. And um, we have also a lot of uh, heating infrastructure. So all the big cities, <laughs> uh, you cannot really talk about big cities in Denmark, but in the big places, um, we are nearly two thirds of all the Danes are connected to district heating and a lot is running on biomass, luckily. Uh, so, and then we, we discuss uh, where could we have these co-location zones. Here's some example uh, and, and where which infrastructure should be built between which spots. 
And uh, we do this um, not by planning, but by um, helping the market to take good decisions. So therefore we uh, provide a lot of information on our homepage where you can see um, where is place in the grid, where is some room in the grid and which kind of production is where. So this is both interesting for new producers and it's also interesting for new consumers. So if you have a special kind of consumption or you want to have green electricity, then you would uh, search, um, go to a certain spot and then apply for a connection there. So we, we try to help the market by a very detailed information. And then there's also information how you can connect. Here's a link on the slide, but it's in Danish. Um, okay, now I jump to the European system a bit about the scenarios. That's also joint planning of electricity and gas. So uh, both ENSOs, uh, that's the ENSO for gas and SOC and ENSO E for electricity are collaborating on the scenarios. National trends is bottom up collected and the other two scenarios um, are constructed according to agreed and consulted storylines. Um, I have to speed up. Um, so we have a process uh, which consists of then translating the storylines into scenarios and uh, um, and uh, figures. So we have a tool connecting um, the demand per carrier and then uh, we create out of this uh, profiles, have a supply tool where we can see w which are the imports, uh, which are the different energy carriers. And uh, from there we get also information on the emissions. Everything goes into, um, into an expansion model for electricity and hydrogen. And there is actually a big improvement compared to the last edition um, where this was more stable. Uh, I can explain it here. Uh, so last edition, we only had the electricity market, but this time also a potential hydrogen market is modeled. And this is modeled by four different configurations so, so that the, um, the usage and the demand and the um, behavior of this hydrogen is reflected in the modeling. So we have uh, indirect hydrogen demand um, which could be um, plants, um, uh, yeah, applying hydrogen, so biogas plants. Then we have direct demand that could be hydrogen refueling stations having a certain flexibility. Uh, then we could have uh, steam methane reforming, uh, so kind of blue hydrogen. And the fourth configuration is then uh, representing the market between countries, between spots, between electricity and hydrogen uh, with direct hydrogen uh, uh, connected to electrolyzers or coming from the market. When you see these uh, orange boxes, that's actually um, the options which the expansion tool uh, has uh, where, where it can expand. So it, it can add infrastructure, it, it can add electrolyzers, and it can add direct uh, connected res, or it can also build connections to the other uh, configurations. So, so just to show that uh, we thought a bit and improved the modeling. Now about the results. Uh, final energy demand, oh, uh, final energy demand is decreasing um, in both scenarios. But you can see electricity demand is increasing, not very surprising due to electrification and use for electric vehicles. Uh, hydrogen in light blue is also increasing in both scenarios, uh, while methane is decreasing uh, liquids as well. Uh, looking at the transport perspective, so that's everything from heavy road and motorbikes and electric vehicles and transport. Um, that's also increasing and you can see it's mainly based on electricity and hydrogen in both scenarios, a bit more in distributed energy than in global ambition. Um, and it's, it builds on both more liquids, uh, but it also builds on innovation in the vehicles and in the um, hardware itself. Electricity demand. Um, 
per sector is increasing per year by 1.4, 1 1.8% 1 uh, each year. And the peak load is increasing faster in this first scenario, the distributed energy, compared to the global ambition. And uh, both uh, uh, in, in both scenarios, it's uh, the transport sector again, which is in blue, and uh, um, and the um, tertiary sector, which uh, the industry sector, which make the difference or which increase most. Uh, hydrogen, again, no surprise, it's. Yes, something. Ah, I can move it. Um, the hydrogen is um, by, uh, mostly used in transport. And so the distributed energy that is in transport and also industry is using it, whereas in global ambition, it's a bit broader. So that is also used in the residential and tertiary sector. Energy production um, by by energy carrier is the first diagram. So you can see a huge increase in uh, onshore wind and offshore wind in both. So it's the light blue and dark blue and also solar. So it's going much more renewable than it was before. And then gas, you can see the same trend and building a lot on hydrogen. You have to speed up. Maybe I jump across this. The message is the same. Uh, but coming back to where I started, uh, so this is about energy imports uh, from in, in Europe. So you can see uh, currently it's uh, 9,000 uh, terawatt hours, uh, which is imported to Europe and a lot of it is gas. And this has to go down to 1,000 um, or in the other scenario, it's two and a half thousand. And uh, in terms of percentage with 55% uh, today, um, dependency on imports, and it has to go down to 10% or a bit about 20. And this is not enough. Also, perspective changed completely. This should go faster. This could uh, should go uh, further down. But this was what we thought um, is where we are. And then a word about can we reach the climate target? Per definition, both scenarios are made to reach the target. And um, but the bad message is that uh, we will overshoot the carbon budget uh, already in uh, 2028 or 2033, because uh, already since the publication of the last report uh, two years ago, we used 17% of that budget, which should be enough until 2050. So then definitely some some. Um, forestry or some negative emission measures are needed uh, to, to bend uh, the curve down again. And the answer of the Commission, uh, as I said again, we have to replace gas as soon as possible and as uh, thorough as possible uh, to be become energy independent. Um, renewables have to expand faster. Uh, offshore is seen as the big game changer. And uh, of course, when in gas terms, it's, it's hydrogen. So then we try to reshuffle this triangle again and uh, to come back to the uh, old plans. But, but this will last long, and this is uh, a big task. Thank you. Mr. Um, yeah, so we've got a really interesting session here um, to take us to the break um, around particularly focusing when we think about flexibility here on hydro, pumped hydro, batteries, long duration storage, um, and looking at how that all fits together in the, in, in the energy systems um, integration issues. So um, all the speakers are virtual for this session, um, but I'll be up there by myself. So um, the, the first speaker is uh, Chris, Chrissy Bisseglia from uh, GE. She's a senior engineer for GE Energy Consulting's Power and Economics Group. She's based in Schenectady, New York. Um, she's great over 15 years of power industry experience in plant equipment design to market production cost modeling and her recent work has been focused on integrating energy storage both the um, use of batteries to replace speaker plants as well as what she's going to talk about here around um, valuing the uh, economic and system benefits of pumped hydro storage so Chrissy, i'll turn it over to you 
Sure. Can you folks see my my uh, slides right now? Yep, we can see them. Great. Thanks. Uh, so as Aiden said, I'm going to talk about a project that we did with the Department of Energy on the value and role of pump storage hydro under high variable renewables. The purpose of this study was to help utilities, PUCs, developers, and planners understand the potential value streams for pump storage hydro, what system conditions unlock those value streams, and to provide tools to help plants optimize to receive those benefits. There were five study areas, each of which I'll talk about today. The first was to develop a pump storage hydro scheduling tool that would co-optimize for both energy and ancillary services while considering price elasticity in the market. The second area was to analyze and quantify how pump storage hydro value changes under various system conditions, like more or less storage competition, gas price variations, et cetera. Since variable speed pump storage hydro can unlock a lot of these benefits, stability models were created so that transmission planners can more accurately study the impact to their grids. And then we use those models to investigate the dynamic stability capability of variable speed PSH to understand its impact on frequency response and transient stability. Lastly, we investigated PSH's contribution to resource adequacy. As I mentioned before, the first part of this study was to create a PSH scheduling tool that optimized for both energy and ancillary services. This work was performed by Dr. Miao Lei Xiao and his team at the GE Research Center and incorporated inputs from our own GE Hydro equipment team. All of the, the tool was written in Python open source software, so you can use it for, it can be adapted for different needs in the future. The tool's in, intended to be run in conjunction with production cost modeling and run it iteratively, iteratively so that we can capture the impacts of price elasticity. Later in this presentation, I'll show how we use the tool for this particular study. In addition to optimizing for variable speed behavior, which was something new as well, um, it's the first optimization tool of its type that incorporates the impact of variable height differences between reservoirs, which can have a significant impact on how the plant can be dispatched. Moving into the production cost portion of our study, to quantify PSH's value under various system conditions, we performed production cost modeling using GE maps. This portion of the study was uh, completed by myself and other members of GE Energy Consulting's power economics team. Some folks are, uh, are there in the room as well. After comparing to some other available databases, we surprise, surprise, chose our own in-house uh, non-proprietary WEC database and we did a 2028 study year with 50% renewable penetration. The largest reason we chose our own database uh, was partially our own knowledge of that database, but also um, the fact that it's a nodal model and we wanted that for, the, for some of the work that we were doing here. Renewables were added to each pool based on NREL's low RE cost scenario for the US and our own pan-Canadian wind integration study for Canada to select where we should place all of those renewables. And as you can see on the chart here, there's um, not every pool is hitting 50%, um, but the overall WEC penetration is. Since adding this much renewable energy to the system is bound to have an effect on existing thermal units, we did a simple cash flow retirement analysis where we iteratively retired units with negative cash flow until either all the units left were making money or we hit a target reserve margin. Additionally, since the location of these renewables is theoretical, we performed a transmission expansion exercise where we alleviated local congestion while still keeping most of the constraints in place. Our base case, which later in the presentation you'll see referred to as low storage, does include some storage. There's approximately 11 terawatt hours of storage on the system, um, which was at, at about 70%, 30% pump storage hydro battery mix. One of the plant locations that we looked at was in California, so we needed to include ancillary services in our model. At the time, GE Maps did not have a built-in ancillary service pricing mechanism. So the process we used, we calculated shadow prices and used KISO regulation and spin requirements to calculate a total ancillary service price in GE maps and then used um, historical KISO spin and regulation prices to determine what 
the price would be for each component. And we found that with that method, we were able to closely match their typical market behavior. One of the key criteria of this study was to understand how pump storage hydro competes when there's other storage on the system and what and different storage options. We assumed a 10 hour duration for pump storage hydro and located it only where there already is pump storage hydro so that we get away from any issues of uh, viability. And then we also did four hour duration batteries installed anywhere in WEC. Using a storage value metric that we defined as annual revenue per installed kilowatt and we did various mixes of pump storage hydro and batteries, we determined that under those assumptions, pump storage hydro was really only competing with itself. It's largely due to the fact that their durations are significantly larger um, and the size of the plants are larger. In the future, it would be beneficial to also look at how they compete on a per gigawatt hour basis. So we selected a high storage scenario um, to, to create for this study. And we chose the point where the two values of both pump storage hydro and battery are kind of similar. So we picked where those lines cross on the first chart there, which is at about, it's 14 gigawatts of storage is when their value starts to decrease. Um, and we did a 70% pump storage hydro, 30% um, uh, battery mix. This gave us a good picture of how pump storage hydro is going to compete against itself, but also doesn't ignore the presence of batteries. The study consisted of 42 cases. We ran both our base low storage scenario and the previously mentioned high storage scenario under base conditions and then six sensitivities. For natural gas prices, we developed high and low gas prices based on EIA data. For hydro generation, we used ABB velocity suite historical hydro generation to identify what would constitute a high, low, or extreme low or drought year. Our baseline hydro generation was then scaled to reflect the change in those years. The last sensitivity we built was the 30% renewable penetration case. Our hypothesis was that pump storage hydro would be more valuable in a high renewable scenario. So we felt it was beneficial to understand how it would perform in a potentially less favorable system. The only exception in this sensitivity is California where we didn't lower the penetration nearly as much since they already have more aggressive policies in place and are very unlikely to stay at a 30% level. One of the other requirements of the study was that we look at two real PSH plants. So we looked at two proposed plants, Big Chino, a 2000 megawatt, 20,000 megawatt hour plant in Arizona and San Vicente, a 500 megawatt, 4,000 hour or megawatt hour plant in California. Both have energy streams, but um, San Vicente also is able to bid into California's ancillary service market. And as we get into the results, you'll see that we looked at two types of benefits, benefits to the pump storage hydro plant itself, as well as benefits that it provides to the overall system in the form of CO2 emission reduction, production cost impacts, reduced thermal cycling, and curtailment avoidance. Overall, we found that the PSH plants had a positive impact on the system level metrics in all the scenarios and all the sensitivities. The darker blue on this table shows where the magnitude of the change was larger. There was no clear winner really for when it provides the most system benefits. It really depends on what metric you want to impact. For example, the PSH plants produce the largest reduction in CO2 emissions in a low hydro high storage scenario but curtailment avoidance is highest in a high hydro, low storage system. Overall though, that's, there's always a positive impact to the system. And on the plant level, both plants benefited more in a higher renewable system, regardless of how much storage they're competing with. They also saw higher revenues in any scenario where the cost of running a marginal thermal unit increased like higher gas prices, because in all cases, there's not enough storage to completely displace gas. So those gas peaking units are always driving the marginal price. Across the board, we also saw that adding more storage decreased the revenues of those plants, confirming our hypothesis that the storage is going to compete against itself. The next part of our study was dynamic modeling. In this portion, um, it was performed by Shruti Rao and other members of GE Energy Consulting's Power Systems Operations and Planning Group. A suite of models was developed to represent variable speed pump storage hydro based on models that were developed in another DOE project as well as GE Hydro's power factory models. 
the high level diagram here shows the interconnection of the five control modules. The frequency controller signal goes as a reference command to the active power controller, which is also getting inputs from the speed and hydraulic model reactive controller that's regulating the voltage of the monitor bus. The internal voltage magnitude command and the real current command are fed to the converter model, which interfaces with the network. We used a type three converter model in this study. For a full converter model, future users can use a wind type four model. We benchmarked the models against the previous DOE project's PSSE model, as well as GE Hydro's power factory model using a range of reference steps, voltage, frequency response, active power, generator loss events, and fault response. And the benchmarking results were determined to be within a reasonable range to effectively model variable speed with small variations. The base case for our dynamic model was created based on the production cost simulation uh, scenario as well. Uh, we used the GE maps model results and filtered to select frequency pinch port points. So they were hours that have the criteria in this blue box here. Um, mostly they're high, high renewable, high pumping hours. We then averaged those and our 2022 light load spring PSLF case load and generation were scaled to meet those values. And we ran the case with both Big Chino installed as well as not installed. Looking at the results here, we ran the loss of two Palo Verde units, which is a standard loss event criteria for WEC with and without Big Chino. And we focused on pumping mode because one of the biggest benefits of variable speed PSH is that it's able to provide frequency response in pumping mode compared to fixed speed units, which can't. With Big Chino, the frequency nadir was higher by 0.05 Hertz compared to without. And the output in pumping mode was reduced by approximately 200 megawatts. Looking at the frequency response obligation measured in megawatt response provided for a 10 millihertz drop in frequency. We see that in the desert Southwest, the system is much closer to meeting obligation with Big Chino than without. And the impact also flows out to WEC as a whole. So we see that it has a, it, installing the pump storage hydro plant has a positive impact on frequency response, both locally and to the overall system. The last piece of the dynamic modeling was to look at the pump storage hydro plant's impact on critical interfaces and fault response. Big Chino had no measurable impact on critical inter interfaces during outages and its response to a fault was as expected. And this kind of surprise a little bit was that the voltage recovered faster with a variable speed unit than it would have with a fixed speed unit. The last piece of our study was to understand the capacity value of storage, particularly these pump storage plants. And this portion was done by Mitch Bringoff and other members of GE Energy Consulting's power economics team. Mitch might be there in the room. I think he might be. Um, so if you have questions later, you can find him. Uh, for this analysis, we used GE Mars, the same underlying assumptions as the production cost portion of the study, and the same two pump storage hydro plans. The analysis was performed with each system, Arizona and California, isolated as opposed to the overall WEX system. And we looked at various hour durations, one, two, four, and eight, to see how capacity value changes. A new version of GE Mars was developed and used for this study to dynamically dispatch the storage. This was a loss of load expectation or LOLE based analysis where reliability in the riskiest hour is analyzed. The effective load carrying capability ELCC of the incremental storage was calculated by first bringing the system without the pump storage hydro plant to an LOLE of one day in 10 years. That's the 0.1 on the chart there. And that's done by adding perfect capacity or load. From there, we added the pump storage hydro plant, which is 0.2 there on the chart. And then we rerun Mars. And the LOLE decreases, or the system becomes more reliable with the added capacity. We then iteratively increase the load until we hit that initial one day in 10 years LOLE. So this is the 0.3 and to get to point four there. And the amount of load that's needed to be added in there is the capacity value of the resource. Each ELCC calculation was done for six different years of wind, solar, and load shapes. And then we averaged the results. The chart here, you can see each year and you can see that they're pretty similar. Uh, the left hand, left hand axis of the chart is capacity value as a percentage of nameplate capacity. In Arizona, the pump storage hydro plant has a capacity value greater than 95% of its nameplate with only two hours of duration. 
And in California, even one hour is close to 100%. On the right-hand chart, you can see that the loss of load shortages all occur in that very short evening peak, which aligns with what we would expect to see with a California duck curve and that extreme ramp at the end of the day there. And explains why the plant's capacity value is so high, even with a short duration, because it's only needed, the loss of load events are gonna occur in just that little tiny space of time. We did several sensitivities for this part of the analysis, um, including reducing wind and solar in the system, variations on hydro, um, removing storage, changes to electrification, as well as ambient temperature impacts on thermal unit capacity. But most of them had very minimal impact. So we're just gonna talk about the solar results here because they're the only ones that showed any real change. The percentages listed in the graph are percent reductions in solar. Um, so that 100% is a complete removal of all solar in the system. And we don't see much change in Arizona, even removing all the solar, the 100% reduction, the capacity value of a PSH plant only drops to about 15%, only drops about 15%. In California, reducing the solar has a much larger impact. When we remove all the solar, the PSH plant doesn't reach 100% capacity value, even with a four hour duration. And at one hour, its value is around 15%. The reason for this change is that when you remove solar from the system, you effectively flatten the duck curve. And so now when we are looking for what the riskiest hours are, they're spread out. They're no longer in that evening peak, but they're spread out and you need a longer duration um, storage to cover those events. So with all that said, the overarching theme of the study was that pump storage hydro provides support to the power grid for resource adequacy, balancing, resiliency, and stability in all the scenarios and that there are tools available to help plant owner, owners unlock all of those values. Pump storage hydro and, and any large storage solutions have a really important place in the energy transition and how we look at the flexibility of our systems going forward. The full report for this study is available at the link that's listed here, um, or you can just search for the title of this presentation um, in a search engine and it'll come up. And several of my GE colleagues are there in the room as well as at other sessions. So if you'd like to connect in person, feel free to reach out to them or to reach out to me directly. And that's it for me, thanks. Thanks, Chrissy. So we'll, um, like the other panel sessions, we'll hold the questions till the end of the, the three panelists. Um, and then we'll, uh, so do hold any questions you have for Chrissy and we can come back to them then. But lots of good information there and different modeling tools and approaches. So. Um, the next uh, presentation is actually two presenters. Um, so we've got a Annie and Scott from uh, Farm Energy. So Annie Baldwin's uh, Director of Product Management of Farm. Um, prior to Farm, Annie led product and commercial strategy at early stage startups focused on energy efficiency, smart grid, agriculture, and EVs. And she's got her MBA and MS in energy from Stanford and a BA from Harvard. Um, Scott then will also be speaking, and um, he's a senior manager for analytics at Farm, uh, where they developed a, a market and project modeling and data science that informs some of the decisions, the communication strategy, product management. Uh, prior to that, he was a fellow at the World Economic Forum, um, Global Future on Energy, and a lecturer and grad student at MIT, focused on improving equity of decentralized and decarbonized systems. So Scott and Annie, I think you're tag team in this, so I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. All right. Um, well, th thank you for having us. Really excited to be here. You know, we follow the ESIG um, work very closely, obviously. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of our days thinking about the future of energy systems and in particular, um, you know, energy systems that are going to be relying increasingly on uh, energy storage and, and renewable energy. And, you know, I think this group is doing some uh, great thinking about how to make sure that those systems are, you know, reliable and cost effective. So, uh, again, very thankful to be here. Um, we're going to be talking to you about, uh, in particular, how multi-day technologies um, can help solve some of the flexibility needs of the future system. Um, Annie, if you don't mind, go to the next slide. You know, what, what we see is really kind of a, a, a fundamental need to transform how the power system is planned and operated as it moves to zero carbon. Um, you know, the, 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 
power system is going to be the linchpin of global decarbonization efforts. If you were to kind of summarize uh, decarbonization in um, two sentences, I think it would be you know, decarbonize the power sector and then electrify everything you can. Um, that's kind of the, the most generic, I think, approach to really decarbonizing the economy. Um, and you know, fortunately, over the last two decades, we've seen a pretty unprecedented drop in the cost uh, and increase in the performance of renewable energy technologies, as well as lithium ion storage. Um, and that's creating uh, a, a huge opportunity to deploy these technologies, uh, predominantly renewable energy, to help lower the cost of the power system and uh, also lower the carbon of the power system. But as that integration um, kind of continues and, and as we hopefully accelerate that integration, we're going to see more periods of intermittency uh, and particularly you know, prolonged periods of intermittency uh, that are gonna be challenging to solve. Um, in addition, you know, as we try and push carbon out of the economy and in particular solve some of the uh, environmental justice challenges that have plagued the, the power system uh, in, in prior years, we're going to be seeing more and more uh, fossil assets come offline. Uh, you know, I think um, the, the MISO, the Midwest region in the United States, is predicting over the next decade that, um, you know, tens of gigawatts of uh, existing thermal assets will be coming offline. And we need to ensure that the system is operating reliability, reliably, uh, despite all of this, you know, increase in intermittent supply, uh, as well as the decrease in existing firm capacity. Um, with the kind of uh, growing uh, concern and impact that climate change is having on uh, our weather system, and in particular the, the impacts that has on um, on you know renewable assets and, and power supply, we need to make sure that we're continuing to be resilient into those systems, all while trying to you know bring assets online in a system that was you know not necessarily designed for this uh, the pace of change that we're really seeing, and so we're starting to see. Uh, real challenges in integrating new assets into the transmission system. So these are kind of the the big, uh, big picture challenges that we're facing on the electric grid. Um, and any, if you don't mind, go to the next slide. You know, when when we see, you know, what are the key challenges uh, to actually getting to a zero carbon system? Uh, you know, there are many, many that are economic, many that are reliability based. Uh, but perhaps kind of the biggest challenge confronting renewables is uh, the 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 um, reality of multi-day uh, reliability events that are caused by low renewable energy generation. Um, this is a snapshot of different studies from around the United States that highlights that uh, the future reliability challenges in the power system will not be driven by you know, your peak period from you know, 4 to 8 p.m., which are uh, you know, the traditional drivers of, of reliability challenges today, but really by multi-day periods of low renewable energy generation um, and in some cases, multi-day periods of high demand driven by heat waves and things like that. Um, and, and that is kind of a, a challenge that is fundamentally very um, difficult to solve with today's existing zero carbon technologies. And it's also why you tend to see calls for uh, you know, firm or dispatchable zero carbon technologies um, as being really critical for a zero carbon power system. Um, Annie, if you don't mind, go to the next slide. I think this was uh, really, very acutely highlighted in 2021 by the uh, uh, winter storm Uri in California, or sorry, in Texas. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this this was a period over several days, uh, really about four days in total, uh, in which, due to very very cold weather and a, um, I would say, maladjusted system, uh, the the supply of both gas and uh, electric power on the system was was uh, severely constrained for several days. Um, this has a, had a massive economic impact on the system, as I'm sure the people in this uh, in this room know. Uh, but it also had an immeasurable impact on you know human welfare and, and the quality of life for many people, and led to you know many unfortunate uh, uh, deaths in many cases. Um, so what we you know I think this is a particularly acute example of the type of challenge that we are going to need to solve in the future, um, as we really move towards a system that is more and more dependent on. Uh, intermittent supply and has uh, less and less access to uh, firms or uh, today's existing firm um, carbon-based technologies. Um, so, you know, at, at Forum and Annie will talk quite a bit more about this, but we're developing a 100-hour battery uh, that can help really provide this multi-day reliability, uh, particularly as the system decarbonizes. 
this is a snapshot of the dispatch and it's you know kind of simplified for uh, easy reading. Uh, but it's a it's an output from some analysis that we have done in Formware, which is an in-house capacity expansion unit commitment and economic dispatch model that we've developed at Form Energy um, to capture the dynamics of, of zero carbon uh, or rather decarbonizing power systems. Um, so you can see, you know, in this in this highly decarbonized uh, system, you have uh, you know very uh, some periods, uh, some multi-day periods, including you know between March 16th and and March 18th, where you have excess renewable energy generation and uh, the kind of larger scale systems um, that, you know, longer duration storage systems can absorb some of that uh, renewable energy. And then you also have uh, similar periods in which, um, you know, for example, from March 13th to March 16th, where you have uh, lower than average renewable energy generation, and you need some kind of technology that can backstop that system. You know, this, this power system is it's based on a, a kind of a longer term outlook for the Midwest uh, ISO. And, you know, you see they still have a very large thermal asset base, a very large uh, fossil fuel asset base. Um, but during those periods, typically you see correlation or correlated events where uh, as, um, as demand uh, can increase or as renewable energy generation falls, demand for gas and other types of uh, fossil fuels really spikes. And you actually see very high correlations between gas prices or other commodity prices and um, you know, low renewable energy generation. Um, so you actually see during some of these periods, while you might have thermal assets, they're actually very expensive to operate um, in, these, uh, in these kind of constrained conditions. And so gas and some of these other technologies are really an imperfect hedge. And that's also another kind of uh, reason why some of these longer duration storage technologies can be really critical uh, and, and can drive a lot of value in the system. Um, this just highlights the, you know, this, that last picture was kind of a zoomed in picture of uh, several days in which you saw some kind of excess generation as well as a shortfall in renewable generation. This kind of zooms out and looks over the entire year at the kind of typical operation of a multi-day energy storage technology. Um, and highlights some of the different kinds of characteristics that you see and, and some of the ways that these technologies can provide flexibility in the system. Um, you know, first here in, in February, you see a, a multi-day discharge. So what this chart is showing is the state of charge. So how much energy is stored in the battery over the year. Um, and you see here on the left, um, essentially a several day period in which the battery is discharging essentially at full power to backstop the system uh, over a multi-day low renewable energy event. Um, here in the middle, you see, and this is very characteristic of, of different, um, different power systems, you see uh, really kind of net charging of the battery. You know, it's, the battery is performing some kind of daily cycling, but on net, it is charging throughout the spring or throughout the shoulder seasons where you tend to have excess removal generation. And then net discharging throughout the summer where you tend to have excess demand relative to renewable generation. And, you know, if you look closely, you can see a lot of, you know, little squiggles on uh, superimposed on this line. So it's, you know, the battery is really operating on a daily basis, but uh, on net throughout that period, it's discharging. Uh, and then, you know, characterizing, like I said, those, those multi-day, or sorry, those intraday events, you do tend to see lots of kind of short bursts of eight to 12 hours um, to either support, you know, hitting those peaks that, um, that are, you know, really critical to hit or managing ramps that you tend to see in a uh, higher renewable power system. So uh, hopefully this gives you a sense of the kind of flexibility that multi-day energy storage technologies can enable. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Annie to talk about, um, you know, what are some of the characteristics of the technology that can actually deliver uh, this kind of flexibility. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, kind of as Scott mentioned, when we think about our 100-hour iron air battery, we think of it as kind of this turnkey asset that can enable total system flexibility. And this is actually how Form got started, was kind of taking a step back on what are, what are the characteristics of a long duration storage asset that we need to enable this deeply decarbonized, reliable and affordable grid. Um, so the first is really around cost, right? As you get to very long, you know, 100 hour plus durations, you wanna be able to add incremental capacity at a very low cost. And this is one of the real drivers of why we selected iron air is because when you, you add incremental capacity, you're doing it with a very low cost uh, anode or energy holding assets, so that's iron. Um, this, you know, when we talk about chemistry entitlement of our iron system, it's less than a dollar per kilowatt hour. Compare that to, you know, lithium ion, which is more like $60 per kilowatt hour in just the pure molecule um, energy basis. Uh, the next characteristic of, of iron is really around 
safety. Um, so just given kind of the uniqueness of our chemistry, there's basically no, no mechanism for thermal runaway. Um, and we have kind of the simplest materials possible. It's really iron, air, and water are what's driving the overall reaction. Uh, the third is around scale. So especially when we think about designing systems, not just within the US, but even worldwide, as, as we heard uh, earlier, um, you really want to be able to leverage and scale and build up your systems to match what that total abundant need. There's um, been some recent studies from McKinsey kind of looking at what the total global energy need is for long duration storage on the, you know, tens of terawatt hours. Um, because we can leverage iron, which is, you know, the most globally abundant me uh, metal is mined in every continent, it's easy to kind of scale up to meet that demand. And then the third, the fourth is really around uh, modularity. So there, the, we're, and I'll talk, talk a little bit about the system design, but really this can be cited anywhere on the grid, meaning that you can basically leverage any kind of existing interconnections or really just place the battery system where you can deliver the most possible system flexibility. Um, and I'll speak just in, in a little bit about how our battery works. You can think of it as a simple reversible rust battery or air breathing battery. Uh, so on discharge, um, we basically breathe in oxygen and then you convert that metallic iron to rust and then on charge, you reverse out the process and you breathe out oxygen. So when we think about the overall system capabilities of our uh, battery plant, it's really just kind of replacing the flexibility that you might see from gas systems today. Um, so, you know, this is a hundred hour system that we can really deliver in repeatable three and a half megawatt blocks that can be scaled up to any system size, you know, hundreds of megawatts, um, which would mean for a hundred hour battery, um, you know, a 10 megawatt system would be about a gigawatt hour. So these are very large capacity systems. Um, the, the round trip efficiency is similar to what you would see from existing gas plants today, and that you can ramp the system uh, in order to deliver that spinning capacity to uh, spinning capacity that you'll get from existing gas plants today. Um, we really want to design our system to deliver that key capacity across these temperature extremes, as Scott mentioned earlier. And so that's really how we're designing our system is to deliver that full rated power um, over those types of events that you might see where you really need that key capacity. In terms of our overall system design, um, this is kind of a, a high level rendering of what that might look like in the field of you know, 100 megawatt scale. Um, what that's included of is a number of these kind of modular enclosures or these DC building blocks of our system. Um, so these are basically fully integrated systems with all of our battery modules, including all auxiliary um, support systems. And this is basically factory made and installed and shipped direct to site. So this is kind of our key product. Uh, included in that is um, and included in a single enclosure um, is about you know, five to 10 battery modules. They're about one meter uh, high, one meter deep. Uh, these include a number of electrochemical cells. And then the core cell is what's really driving that chemistry, that reversible rust reaction I showed earlier. So this is our series of anodes and uh, air electrodes surrounded in an aqueous electrolyte. And when we think about flexibility, this is really allowing, allows us to design and implement these energy storage systems in basically any kind of size, 10 to hundreds plus of megawatts, and really kind of uh, design with a unique um, system layouts as well. Just in terms of uh, where form is today, we're really driving towards enabling deep decarbonization over the next decade. Uh, we've announced two projects. Um, you know, one, and this is our first, is with Great River Energy. Um, they were one of the first key customers that saw this need for a multi-day type storage system um, out in Cambridge, Minnesota, where they've basically re retired most of their coal plants and are reliant on wind and are basically looking for a key source of firm capacity. So we'll be delivering a one and a half megawatt, 150 megawatt hour system uh, in the next year and a half. Uh, and then following on with that, we've also um, announced a really exciting partnership with Georgia Power, which is about a 15 megawatt uh, system, 1500 megawatt hours, um, that delivers that kind of key capacity to help them along their decarbonization pathway. Uh, so these are the two that, that we're public about and really just kind of excited to continue to build from there. And with that, uh, we uh, that's everything we have, but looking forward to, to the discussion later. Thanks, Annie and Scott. Uh, very interesting um, new developments there. Uh, so the last piece, and I think, Charlie, we are starting to find some flexibility right here. So, um, the last person who has been doing a lot of innovative work to, to look for this is, uh, is Kai Van Horn. So Kai's uh, an expert in energy system modeling, analysis, and visualization. 
uh, to look at the, the impacts and illuminate the impacts of the energy transition and develop and communicate strategic responses. Um, he's currently exploring pathways to deep decarbonisation and the challenges and opportunities that brings to utilities and their customers. Um, he's a national grid and um, he uh, received a PhD in electrical and, and computer engineering from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So, Kai, turn it over to you. Thanks, Aiden. Let me just share my screen and get started. All right. Well, hello, Tucson. Um, thanks uh, to the other panelists for doing a little bit of my work for me, kind of introducing the topic of energy storage and why it's important. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit. But what I'm mostly going to focus on today is uh, something that's uh, maybe a little bit in the technical weeds, but I think that, uh, that's very uh, welcome fodder for this group. But uh, modeling energy storage in non-chronological capacity expansion. Uh, so looking at something that may not uh, at first blush seem like um, a typical approach, uh, but as I'll get into, uh, there are some advantages to doing this. So I'll talk first about what is driving uh, the need to think about how we model energy storage. Um, then look a little bit about what are the options available, uh, especially in capacity expansion for modeling energy storage. And you know, what are the key features of storage that we aim to capture uh, when we're doing this type of modeling? Like what is important? What drives value? Uh, and then I'll, as an example, uh, talk a little bit about how some, how some work we've done on, on capturing chronological features in a non-chronological model, and uh, along with the case study that shows you know, how that works. Uh, and then finally, we will just talk about what you should take away from this uh, when you walk out that door. Uh, so first, uh, as many have alluded to, you know, we're in an energy transition. Uh, we're early on or very far along, depending on where you are. Um, but in, at any rate, over the next, you know, 10 uh, years, 20 years, 30 years, we're going to see uh, a transformation in the energy sector. Uh, in the near term, especially, it's largely electric supply that is going to see that transformation as renewables cost fall and uh, states put in place increasingly ambitious mandates in order to transform um, electric supply uh, to non-emitting generation or decarbonize. At the same time, more energy is being drawn into the electric sector through electrification of transport and heat. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we have you know, historic pace of retirements for uh, thermal plants. And so what does all this add up to uh, really is uh, that there's a, a growing demand for flexibility. Um, flexibility to meet the needs that uh, the system has for different services that are provided today and services that we will need in the future. So what does that mean for storage is that at the moment storage is sort of on the, on the, at the vanguard. It's poised to become one of the key sources of flexibility. And what I'm going to focus on a little bit uh, in contrast to the prior presentation from Forum is a little bit on short duration, or shorter duration storage, a battery storage. Um, but over the next 10 years, battery storage really is um, uh, going to see significant growth. I mean, we see it just in the state goals or targets that I'm showing here on the left, you know, tens of gigawatts of battery storage and targets uh, for some of the states that have ambitious uh, renewables or decarbonization goals. And then as we look longer term, uh, on the right, I'm showing um, some, some uh, anticipated costs for developing those types of assets, the lithium ion batteries, uh, relative to a, a gas CC, say, another source of flexibility. And we can see that as we push out to 2030 and beyond, uh, that the lowest cost source of capacity uh, may become battery storage. Um, which will further drive um, adoption of those resources. And I think just we've also seen so much about hybridization and the interconnection queues just blowing up with renewables and storage. So all this kind of uh, requires that we kind of think through how, how is this going to unfold? You know, we're sitting here in 2022 uh, and the energy transition is happening, but you know, where, where is the storage uh, going to be and how is it going to get built out? So to kind of plot that path forward um, for storage development, it's really important for policymakers and planners to have uh, tools that can help them answer questions about how much, you know, what types, where, and when. Uh, as, a, as a general, as a, 
as a general, uh, general thing. I mean, these are pretty um, standard planning questions, uh, but in the context of storage, they're really critical here. And we need to make sure that the tools that we're using uh, can really help us uh, unpack that. So capacity expansion models have been for a long time a way of understanding uh, from an electric supply perspective, the answers to these questions. Um, for storage though, it gets um, a little trickier um, and that's because chronology is super important uh, for storage or at least chronological features of uh, battery storage and other types of storage. That is to say the relationship uh, between different hours and how the storage is operated. Um, because there's really two types of capacity expansion model. There's a type of capacity expansion model, which I'll say is called the chronological capacity expansion model, which is uh, used uh, more frequently in recent years because of advances in computing. And that keeps uh, chronolo chronology in the model and says, like, looks at representative days or weeks in order to assess uh, when assessing the dispatch of the resources that are being built by the capacity expansion model. Um, and that's great for modeling storage. I mean, it explicitly differentiates technology types, different durations of batteries, other features. Um, and it captures the energy constraints, which are really important to uh, um, drive the potential demand for additional resources that might be created by adding a lot of storage to the system. Um, however, it does have some downsides. You know, when we are forced to choose certain chronologies, we, we risk overfitting to that limited set of chronologies. On top of that, it can be really expensive for uh, uh, modeling intertemporal constraints. And uh, you know, so, it, 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 and so we could be forced to limit uh, other things in the model in order to capture more chronologies or limit chronologies to capture other things in the model. Uh, so that, that the other type of capacity expansion is non-chronological capacity expansion. This is probably the type that most uh, planners are, are familiar with is the, the type that's been used for you know, time immemorable and power system uh, planning. So it's basically, you know, you take your hours as represented in that left-hand chart and you stack them all uh, and make a low duration curve. And then you uh, do your capacity expansion with a low duration curve. And it's really computationally efficient. Um, and, you know, that abstraction, if you think about it beyond the low duration curve, but maybe in terms of sort of clustering and if we want to uh, uh, bring machine learning into this, um, it allows you to capture maybe a broader range of conditions than just a limited set of chronologies. Um, but that loss of chronological information means that it's not uh, straightforward or it's not immediately apparent to how to capture the key features of energy storage. So I mean, you would need some heuristics in order to model energy storage in that framework. And so what I'm going to talk about is basically that there's some advantage maybe to non-chronological modeling with storage if you can address this need um, to develop heuristics. So before going there, I just want to point out several features of energy storage that are important in um, to capture in capacity expansion planning. Uh, if we're to try to answer those questions about how much, when, and especially what types of storage. So the first is that you know we have to recognize that storage is energy constrained. You got to charge it if you're going to discharge. That feature is critical. Uh, second, uh, we want to be able to differentiate technology types. So stored duration or other attributes uh, should be differentiated in the model so that you can pick between alternatives. Uh, three, um, it needs to be able to flexibly align with load and renewables profiles. So that's a fee that's a that's like kind of a key, especially in the context of this panel of modeling the or of capturing flexibility. The flexibility of storage is its ability to align those things. And then four is that, um, and this kind of ties back into differentiating technology types, but I like to break it out. Uh, is that capacity value or ELCC, the contribution to reducing loss of load risk, is important uh, in modeling storage and capacity expansion, and especially when differentiating technology types. Uh, and storage durations. So these are all, uh, except for the uh, capacity value in a sense, um, chronological features. You know, they require a chronological model typically to represent. But uh, I would posit that with thoughtfully designed heuristics, we can bring these chronologically depend or chronology dependent features into storage in a non-chronological model. So in a more traditional capacity expansion model, and and with benefits. 
So I'll talk a little bit now about how we've done that for some of these features. So first, I'm going to just tackle the, the main one, the energy constraint. So, you know, in capacity expansion modeling with non-chronologic, without chronology, as I mentioned before, you know, you sort of stack up all the hours and each one becomes a period and, or you stack up, you select all of these periods or clusters and each one is independent. So you don't necessarily say in one period, I'm going to discharge the storage and then in the next one, I'm going to uh, charge the storage because there's no relationship of this and the next. Um, Instead, you have a set of periods that in totality represent, you know, a year or a month or whatever period you're representing in your capacity expansion model. Let's consider it a year for this. Uh, so one way that uh, we address this is that, um, you know, instead of saying that, like, for every day, you need to, you know, balance charges and discharges, we recognize that, you know, there's these, these clusters represent periods basically of high net load and of low net load. Or depending on how you do it, you know, high renewables uh, periods and low renewables periods, which would generally align to the times that you would charge and discharge uh, storage. So if you simply impose an energy constraint over all the periods, um, it's a rough, it's a, it's an approximation of a, a daily energy storage constraint, say, or as you would see in a chronological model. So it's not to say that if you, you know, reconstructed the year from the different um, periods that you use in your capacity expansion model that it would perfectly align energy. Uh, but it does capture this aspect that you need to charge in order to discharge. So it, that brings that feature in the capacity expansion uh, model, which is the important thing. Um, and then, you know, it also uh, still allows for flexibility so that the model can dispatch up and down within those periods. Uh, but one thing, if you just do this, is that there's no differentiation between different durations of storage. Uh, so one way that we've addressed that is recognizing some of the sort of structure that exists when running these models. In some sense, when you run these models, you kind of can know in a way what some of the answers are going to be even before you run the model. You know that um, generally storage is going to charge and discharge. Uh, along with the net load, as I mentioned, for the energy constraint. And so one way to differentiate types is to recognize that and um, provide some sort of limitations, additional constraints that value, um, that, that constrain the dispatch of shorter duration batteries uh, to something below that of longer duration batteries. So here I'm showing in a from a chronological view, uh, like what that would look like for an average day um, if you were to look at it chronologically, saying that you would, if you were to dispatch batteries over this day, that your two hour battery would, um, would be dispatched below your eight hour battery. And so if we use this idea um, and we have this all get rearranged in the different periods, it basically does the same thing. It captures this idea that if you want to, uh, if you build a two hour battery, your dispatch is more limited than when you build an eight hour battery. And that brings in this differentiation of different durations, at least for batteries, into the non-chronological modeling uh, when combined with the energy constraint. But this alone, uh, we found, was not sufficient to capture one other important aspect, and that's the flexibly aligning with uh, different renewables profiles. So another way of so a way of going at that is to dig into each of, say, for the six hour battery, dig into sort of like what is that profile and what is driving how that profile would look if I were to, to construct it. And so that, that kind of carried us to um, differentiating into three types of profiles. You know, batteries have different sort of archetype dispatch um, uh, drivers. And one is, you know, if there's a ton of PV on the system, uh, then you would dispatch that battery with some alignment to the PV. You would charge it in the middle of the day and you would discharge it at other times. Another would be offshore wind um, if you're in places where a lot of offshore wind is coming onto the system, such as the Northeast. Uh, and then finally, there's you know your typical, like, this is the more traditional approach of looking at how load uh, would just how the battery would dispatch around load. So by providing multiple options in this way, uh, the model can choose even though it's not able to you know, choose exactly what those profiles look like, 
it can dispatch within those profiles and it can build batteries in a non chronological model. You can build batteries that could construct an aggregate profile that's very flexible relative uh, to what you might see in a chronological model. So, and I'll show some in the case study of how that, how that works out. So finally, and uh, I'll just touch on this briefly, is just the capacity value ELCC point. And uh, really this is just, a, there's two things here. One is that it differentiates batteries in any period of time by saying basically that there's a different capacity value for different types of batteries. And then also some recognition in capacity expansion that you know, as you add batteries to the system that the capacity of batteries tends to fall. Uh, and so over time you would expect that storage increases that capacity value would decline. Uh, and so that can really have an impact on uh, how much storage gets built. So it's an important thing to consider even if it's not as, uh, as direct in this line that I've been going down. All right, so that's sort of the, the example. Now let me just touch it on a couple of things with the case study. Uh, I'm gonna talk about basically three cases and just uh, compare uh, a reference case, which is a model that uses all the heuristics described before. Uh, and we're gonna compare that to a case with capacity only storage. So storage is a capacity resource. So we can show how uh, having flexibility in the, in the ways that we have, like creates uh, or does demonstrate value for storage. And then uh, as a second step, I'll show another case where I compare the reference to an extra flexibility case where there's no limit on the storage dispatch profiles. So that's gonna show how um, constraining things can create differentiation between the different durations. So first, if I compare the reference and capacity only cases here, uh, I'm showing the added PV and battery capacity for the case, just focusing on that aspect. There's a lot of other things getting built too and retired, but focusing on this because it shows most clearly what's going on. But here's a gigawatts of cumulative added capacity uh, for each type of resource that gets built and for different years uh, between the reference and capacity only cases. If the 2030, 2035, and 2040 are shown uh, here. So first, just to note that we kind of start in the same place in 2030. By that time, uh, we're seeing mostly just resources that are already queued to be built and uh, storage, driv storage bills driven by uh, policy mandates. Um, but then going on be beyond 2030 is where we see electrification start to bite and more load growth, then you start to see builds and also more retirements, you start to see additional builds. And in our reference case, that looks like some additional PV here and a fair amount of six hour uh, battery storage. And then our capacity only case, it's slightly less of each. Then by 2040, you see we have a tremendous amount of PV and six hour battery storage in our reference case and less battery storage. So it's not totally clear there in the capacity only case but substantially less PV. So basically, I think what this is showing is that one, if you just focus on a single value stream, um, you're not capturing all the value of the storage and so less storage gets built. Um, and then second, and perhaps more importantly, uh, if we don't model a flexibility, if we, if we, but if we can capture flexibility through some heuristics, then we, um, uh, we really uh, can, can capture a better trade-off between building PV versus wind, which is what fills in for the lack of PV here, and other types of renewables. It really captures that alignment value of the storage. So then in the next uh, comparison from our reference, this reference case to our extra flexibility case, uh, where we don't constrain the dispatch profiles of the storage in this non-chronological model, uh, it shows the value of differentiating different durations. Uh, first, uh, we kind of we start again in the same place, and through 2035 and 2040, we see actually a similar uh, level of build, slightly more storage in the extra flexibility case. Uh, but the main difference here is that the balance of resource type or the duration type is more towards four hour in this extra flexibility case, and. That makes sense because in this case, we haven't constrained things from a flexibility perspective. We still differentiate on capacity value, but from a flexibility perspective, all the storage looks the same to the model. And so it would prefer to build 
for, even just for the flexibility, uh, I would prefer uh, to build this four hour storage because it costs less than the six hour storage. If there's no recognition that actually the four hour storage doesn't give you as much flexibility as, as the six hour storage. So that just shows how um, applying these different limitations can drive the model to a, to a, sol a different solution uh, than it would have found if we didn't have that in there. And, and that it can learn to trade off between these two, uh, two types of storage. Second is that we see a PV build that's only a little bit higher than in our reference case in this flexibility case, which is to say that, you know, even with the sort of uh, like shapes that we've chosen, chosen, we've provided enough flexibility for the model to find like a sort of optimal amount of PV build for the system. So what does that all build to? I think, you know, I said it before that with the right heuristics, we think that non-chronological capacity expansion offers a viable approach to study the role of storage in the energy transition um, and can provide us meaningful answers to those important questions, uh, particularly the, the sort of what types question. Um, and I would say that, you know, of course, both types of capacity expansion have a lot of value in studying that the numerous uh, challenges that we need to sort of address if we're going to decarbonize. Um, but this type, non-chronological capacity expansion, I think is especially valuable when we're looking at very long time horizons or uh, models where we want to have a lot of detail in other areas, such as the transmission system, uh, or if we want to try to co-optimize transmission and supply, which we've done some of that here. You know, adding in these features for storage um, can be done without impacting computation very much. And so you can really build a more holistic view uh, um, while also including um, the key, key features of storage. And then just some caveats, of course, uh, that capacity expansion mod modeling, of course, generally is not a substitute for detailed operational si uh, simulations. Uh, I think they are complementary. We, study, we have different questions for capacity expansion models than we do for uh, like production cost modeling uh, simulation. And, you know, we use them together in order to get at the best view of what, uh, in order to sketch out the best path forward. Uh, second, which sort of relates back to the prior presentation, which is seasonal shifting, which is a super important feature of long duration storage. Now, that's not tr treated at all in what I've talked about here. And that would need additional, uh, additional design in order to to bring in uh, and just the idea of like, what is a season when you have independent periods? Uh, and though not discussed here, that cluster selection uh, or sort of like, how do you get those net load curve steps or how do you do time series reductions? You know, there's many, many names for this, but it's critically important when you're working with non-chronological models. So, you know, it's a very underappreciated, I would say, assumption that goes in, but it's so important and it drives so much that it really deserves uh, the spotlight uh, at the early stages of model design. Um, so I'll end it there. And I guess now we're going into the panel. So I look forward to the, the questions.